Hello, I'm Peter Singer, Director of the 21st Century Defense Initiative here at Brookings, and it's my honor to welcome all of you to this event with General Allen on the U.S. mission in Afghanistan. In addition to those of you joining us here today in person, I'd also like to welcome the audience that's joining us via CNN.com and Twitter. In our field, we often try to cut to the heart of the matter by reaching out to the numbers behind a key debate in foreign policy. Here at Brookings, for example, we host the Afghanistan Index, the one-stop shop for all key data and figures on the operation. The thinking behind this is, as Einstein once said, breaking an issue down to its raw numbers offers the, quote, poetry of logical ideas. The challenge for all of us, though, in the last few weeks of debate, both in the media and on Capitol Hill, is that we've seen how the numbers that surround the mission in Afghanistan can be deployed in a way that very much illustrates the saying that was attributed to the Scottish politician who said, quote, you might prove anything by numbers. These are just some of the numbers that surround the Afghan operation right now. 557 billion, that's the amount that the US government has spent overall on our mission in Afghanistan over the last 10 years. To put that into context, this is slightly more than the US government spent on the entire depression era New Deal in current figures. 8.2 million. That's the number of Afghan children who are currently enrolled in school, compared to less than 1 million in 2001. 89,000. That's roughly the number of U.S. troops deployed to Afghanistan. 2,996. That's the number of American citizens killed in the 9-11 attacks that led to the start of the U.S. mission in Afghanistan. 350. That's the number of IED attacks in January 2012. 150 more than in December of 2009 when the surge started. 180, that's Afghanistan's ranking in corruption in the world. Only two countries list behind it, Somalia and North Korea. 138, that's the number of Afghan army battalion formations presently deemed independent, up from 101 just a year ago. 78%, that's the um, number of Americans according to a February poll who backed President Obama's decision to begin the Afghan drawdown. 54, that's the percent of Americans who want to pull out of Afghanistan even if the Afghan army is not adequately trained. 27, that's the percent of attacks initiated by the insurgency that are down in the last month compared to the same time last year. Nine, that's the publicly reported number of U.S. servicemen who gave their life in Afghanistan this month, making a total of 1915 over the last 10 and a half years. My point here is that the numbers for all their power can only tell part of the complex story that is the US mission in Afghanistan right now. That's why we are so honored to host this important conversation today, to go beyond the simplicity of the numbers and dig deeper into the heart of the matter. This conversation will be led by my colleague, Michael O'Hanlon, Michael is our director of research here at Brookings 21 CDI, an author of two books that specifically relate, one, Toughing It Out in Afghanistan, and the other, a new book called Bending History, Barack Obama's Foreign Policy. But perhaps the numbers that best illustrate why he's so suited to this conversation are 2,200,000 and eight. These are the number of times that Mike has been cited in Google related to Afghanistan, showing how he's been a critical voice in shaping the public debate. And eight is the number of research trips that he's conducted there, serving as both an election observer and also um, with visits to ISAF, Canadian Forces, and U.S. Marines. And joining Mike is General John Allen, U.S. Marine Corps. The number that perhaps best introduces General Allen is 1976. That's the year he graduated with honors from the Naval Academy to begin his distinguished service to the nation. In the time since, he's earned three additional master's degrees from Georgetown Defense Intelligence College and National War College. He served in a variety of roles, command of the basic school, 79th Commandant of Midshipmen at the Naval Academy, the first ever Marine Corps officer to serve in this position, Principal Director of Asian and Pacific Affairs in the Office of Secretary of Defense, command of the 2nd Marine Expeditionary Brigade, deploying to Iraq for OIF 06 and 08, Deputy Commander of U.S. Central Command, and currently Commander of International Security Assistance Force Afghanistan and U.S. Forces Afghanistan, a role that he began in July of 2011. Mike, General, thank you very much for joining us today for this important conversation. Thank you, Peter. Peter, thank you. And let me uh, ask everyone here to please join me in thanking and welcoming General Allen to Brookings. (laughs) 
the way we'd like to proceed today, and thank you all very much for being here yourselves, is, is roughly as follows. We're going to talk for about 25 minutes and have an opportunity to bear down on some of the issues concerning current operations and the current campaign in Afghanistan. In, in the period of time between now and 2.15 or so when we're doing that, you are invited to pen a possible question on an index card that you will have found on your chair. Uh, and please be done with that by 2.15, because at that point, we will ask people to come to these outside aisles and collect the cards. So they're going to bring them to me. This is for maximum efficiency uh, in our use of time. And uh, you're welcome, of course, to express whatever questions you would like and think I won't have posed by then myself, since you'll have to be guessing where I'm going a little bit. But we are going to focus primarily on the campaign, on operations in Afghanistan. Uh, we're not going to be as inclined to prognosticate about where debates may go in this town or in Kabul or Islamabad or such matters. And of course, we can't get into sensitive diplomatic issues. But with all that said, this is Brookings. And General Allen has proven uh, through his running of Annapolis and other distinguished uh, academic efforts and his testimony on the Hill last week that he's more than up to the challenge of discussing a very complex topic. So let's begin, uh, General, if you don't mind. And what I'd like to do, and having reviewed the transcripts from last week in your testimonies, I'd like to just give you a chance at first to explain in broad terms where you think the campaign is right now. Because a lot of times we focus on the latest incident or we focused on the question that naturally concerns Americans of how much longer do our troops have to stay. But I don't know if we always get an understanding back here as much as we need to of you know, where we are in the evolution of this campaign. I just wanted to ask you to, in your own broad terms, whether it's going back to when you took command or even further and bringing us up to date, uh, where do we stand in the operation? Sure. Well, when I took command, uh, on the 18th of July, uh, within minutes, actually, I had my first meeting with my commanders uh, and then met uh, with the senior leaders throughout the, the uh, theater very quickly thereafter. And I gave them four priorities. Uh, the first priority was to continue the continuity of the campaign, to continue to pressure the enemy uh, as much as we possibly could with the, with, uh, uh, the forces available. Uh, and the intent was uh, to facilitate through uh, a continuity of the campaign, other outcomes which uh, might accrue, uh, a willingness to in, be engaged in reconciliation, for example, uh, an acceleration of reintegration, those kinds of things. So the first priority was to uh, maintain the continuity of the, the campaign and continue to pressure the enemy. The second was to do all we could uh, to accelerate the movement of the ANSF into the lead, into the fore. Uh, the idea being that, of course, in, in a counterinsurgency, <clears throat> especially where foreign forces are involved, you really are attempting to do two things. One is to shape the campaign, uh, shape the insurgency uh, within that campaign. But the other very important thing that you're attempting to do uh, is to uh, shape the defeat mechanism uh, of the insurgency. And that's a bit of a stark for, uh, term, but the defeat mechanism in many respects and, and in most uh, counterinsurgencies uh, is the indigenous force itself. So in uh, shaping the campaign with campaign continuity using the uh, ISAF forces and at the same time building the ANSF, the idea of course would be to move them to the fore to be the principal uh, and the lead element within the counterinsurgency over time. So that was my second priority. And then the third priority was to set the conditions uh, and ultimately support uh, the concept of transition as it had been enunciated uh, in the Lisbon summit in November of, of 10. And then my fourth priority was just be prepared, be agile, uh, be prepared for uh, changing situations as they may evolve or present themselves, uh, both at, uh, at the level of being a commander, uh, but also with the staffs for the purposes of, of planning to account for the unexpected or a wild card scenario. Uh, with that as, as uh, my early perception of the priorities for uh, my tenure as commander, I haven't changed any of those. Uh, shaping the uh, insurgency, continuing the continuity of the campaign, maintaining pressure on the enemy, I think, uh, is still the, the number one priority. But right behind it, and, and increasingly nearly on the same line, uh, is the concept of moving the ANSF into the lead. So where do we find ourselves now? Uh, 2012 is, is a year that will have uh, a variety of unique operational uh, conditions to it. Uh, the first is, of course, we'll, we will be in the second phase of the 
uh, recovery of the surge forces, uh, the drawdown associated with that. Uh, those forces will uh, start moving out of the theater uh, probably within several weeks, the, the lead echelons of that. Uh, I'll make my final decision uh, with respect to those 23,000 troops uh, and ultimately submit those, uh, that decision through the chain of command uh, ultimately to the president. Uh, those troops need to be out of the theater uh, by the 30th of September. Uh, other <clears throat> important dimensions to uh, the 2012 will be obviously the reposturing of the combat power within the theater to account for the departure of 23,000 troops. Uh, we will also be inserting uh, the lead echelons and most of uh, the advisory force, uh, which we hope uh, will continue the process of developing the ANSF and, and in fact, may be able to accelerate the ANSF into the lead. Uh, this is a unique uh, fighting season this year uh, in that where Ramazan hits, Ramadan called elsewhere, but uh, Ramazan hits, uh, it may, in fact, although we're not sure yet, it may, in fact, create some uniqueness to this particular uh, fighting season in that it could have the appearance of, of being two fighting seasons instead of one. Uh, and, and in terms of the, the unfolding of the fighting season, we had some uh, pretty good success last year in the south, uh, in particular in Kandahar and in the central Helmand River Valley. And we'll be seeking to leverage that success this year by consolidating uh, our hold in the south uh, while we'll continue to employ our combat power in the east uh, in a counterinsurgent mo mode, uh, obviously, to take care of the, the insurgency as it has continued uh, to boil in the east. Uh, in the north and in the uh, west, there has been, I think, some significant success uh, in the north in the German-led element of the coalition uh, and in the west with the Italian-led uh, elements of the coalition. Uh, and our desire there will be to continue to secure uh, key lines of communication, uh, but also to, to continue to secure uh, the population centers as well, to deny the enemy access back into the population across the country, but in, but in general, uh, in the north and in the south, or north and in the west, and then in the south uh, around Kandahar and the central Helmand River Valley, while in the east we'll seek to push out, uh, out of the uh, uh, Kabul security zone, some of the, what we'll call the orbital districts and orbital provinces. Uh, so it's gonna be a, a busy summer, uh, and uh, we anticipate that uh, the campaign will balance the, the drawdown of the surge forces uh, with the consolidation of our holdings in the south, continued combat operations uh, in the east uh, as we uh, insert the advisors into the Afghan security forces with the idea of pushing them into the lead. Could I follow up a little bit on, you've really sketched it out beautifully and really set up most of where I want to go in the next 20 minutes. Let me, before I come back to the Afghan security forces and ask you to explain a bit more about why they are in some ways better than we thought, which was a memorable phrase you used last Tuesday with the House Armed Services Committee. Before I come to that, I'd like to ask you to explain a little bit more sector by sector in the country, the trends that you see going on. You just uh, touched on a number. Um, but let me uh, just ask you to start with Kabul in the north and west. And I think you've just suggested that these are all looking reasonably good. Of course, uh, there are still journalists and um, members of non-governmental organizations and other travelers to Afghanistan who are struck by the fact that these parts of the country are more dangerous than they were five, six years ago. And so I'm wondering how to square what, what these folks sometimes say with what you just said. I think I understand the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you as to what's the overall condition in Kabul where we saw these spectacular attacks last year mm -hmm. to the point where sometimes the whole buzz was about, is Kabul now under siege? Is this you know, uh, an, an equivalent to, um, uh, you know, some kind of a siege of the capital city like we've seen in Vietnam and other wars, uh, or are the North and the West slipping away and the Taliban starting to nestle itself within uh, Pashtun populations in those areas and use these as bases to assassinate key leaders and otherwise stoke up violence? How, how would you explain the trends and why do you say that they've gotten a little bit better in these parts of the country? Well, if we measure a whole variety of, of uh indices and indicators, and uh, the uh, initiation of enemy attacks is one of the uh, biggest indicators for us. Uh, and in Kabul, uh, that number on a week-to-week -week basis, and we're, we watch it very closely, uh, is uh, one percent or less of the hundred percent that would constitute all of the enemy-initiated attacks across the country. 
Uh, in RC North, uh, that number is 5% or less typically, and in RC West is 5% or less. Uh, and you're right, uh, I, I think that the uh, Taliban has sought to, to seek advantage in the uh, Pashtun enclaves in the North and in the West. But interestingly, uh, in the North and in the West, we've, uh, we've achieved our uh, greatest successes in reintegration. Uh, on uh, 1 January, roughly 1 January of uh, 2011, there were about 600 or so reintegrates across the country. Uh, yesterday I saw the number, it, it appears to be about 3,880 since 1 January 11. Uh, and many of those have come out of the north. There's another 400 or so in the pipeline for acceptance. Uh, and so we've, we've seen both uh, in the numbers that we track uh, a reduction in enemy, enemy initiated attacks in Kabul, the province of Kabul, uh, RC North, uh, and in RC West. We, we've also seen a reduction in numbers in the central Helmand River Valley. Uh, in some of those areas, uh, pretty dramatic numbers, as much as 80% reduction. Uh, in enemy initiated attacks. It doesn't mean there isn't violence. It doesn't mean there isn't criminality. But in the numbers that we track, that number has come down. Uh, it has gone up, however, in RC East. Uh, and that's, I think, to be expected. That's a different kind of insurgency in some respects. Uh, and it is one that's going to require some uh, significant combat power uh, to come. So I could focus on the East. And uh, again, congratulations. And I know you and your troopers have made huge headway in the South. And I guess now the hope is, as you say, to make the transition uh, to Afghan lead and hold on to the gains and keep building on them. But exactly in the, right. But in the East, uh, as, as you've underscored today and last week, uh, there's still a big problem. There are a number of big problems. And I guess uh, I'd like to talk about the sanctuaries in Pakistan. But before I do that, uh, ask you to explain how we can do a robust counterinsurgency in the East uh, with the number of forces that you're going to have available, obviously fewer than some previous commanders had once expected or hoped, and in a population that's much larger in the east than the total Afghan population in Kandahar and Helmand combined. So just to give us a bit of an intuitive feel for how you can do counterinsurgency in that kind of a challenging situation, and certainly the topography is no easier in the east than it is in the south either. Sure. So how do you how do you even conceptualize a robust counterinsurgency campaign for the East that I guess you're going to be conducting this year and next? Well, it's, it's multifaceted, obviously, as any counterinsurgency would be, uh, it's, and it's a variety of a number of things. We, we are able now to have the kind of conversation with General Karimi uh, within the context of the ANSF and the ANA in particular uh, to talk about the, the reinforcement uh, and ultimately to take advantage of uh, improved capabilities of the 201st and 203rd Corps. Uh, they, have, they have matured, uh, and the intention is ultimately, without getting into too much uh, specificity on operational detail, the intention will be to uh, beef up their capabilities. So there is the first bit of force increase uh, that we'll need. Uh, they will be paying some particular attention uh, to Nuristan and Kunar, uh, east of uh, Kabul, along the Route 7 economic corridor that we hope will ultimately begin to take hold. Uh, and then south uh, of Kabul, we'll ask for some additional assistance uh, in the uh, Wardak, Logar, and uh, Ghazni area. In fact, we'll be bringing in some additional U.S. combat power in the time remaining uh, for uh, the uh, troops available that I have uh, this coming summer. Uh, to do some specific work in Ghazni. Uh, so it's not just a function of uh, the, the ISAF troop strength uh, in a general uh, term. It is also going to be, uh, for the first time, uh, our ability really to partner with the ANSF at a campaign level. And this year, the Naweed campaign, uh, which we're undertaking now, it's, it's basically from January through June of 2013, was very much a bilateral campaign. Uh, where we sought to uh, harmonize the placement, employment, and ultimately the uh, deployment of uh, uh, Afghan forces in a way that could augment uh, our forces in the east. Uh, the terrain is very different, as you say. The insurgency is a different kind of insurgency than uh, our forces encountered in the south, in RC South and RC Southwest. Uh, but our intention this year is to work very closely uh, with the Afghans in the 201st and 203rd Corps uh, anticipating some additional increase in uh, combat power. Also, uh, it's my intention uh, 
uh, that of the forces uh, that we will uh, have uh, both in terms of the drawdown period and the period remaining thereafter, that I'll leave a greater density of those forces in RC East uh, to work in partnership with the, the 201st and 203rd Corps. Uh, as well, there are a number of other resources that we have available to us. The Afghan local police uh, have turned out to be extraordinarily valuable for us in a number of areas. And if you were to plot on the map where these Afghan local police or these village stability operations uh, are occurring, what you find is that they, they are uh, going in and they're uh, anticipated to be in place in areas that specifically uh, support the, the counterinsurgency in the east. Uh, as well, uh, over the last year or so, particularly in, particularly in the last year, uh, we've had some pretty significant uh, success with the Afghans in the development of their nine uh, commando Kandaks, their nine commando battalions. Uh, and we anticipate uh, employing those units uh, as well for focused operations, both for disruption uh, and uh, as an augmentation for our uh, general purpose operations. Uh, but also I fully intend or fully expect uh, that our special operators in, in the terms of our task force ops will also be going in simultaneously. So it's a combination of what will remain in RC East of the ISAF forces, uh, what will be brought in to bear uh, in augmentation in terms of a combined campaign, what additional forces will be brought in uh, from the uh, ANSF, uh, continued operations with the Kandaks, additional uh, placement of village stability operations platforms and ALP units, uh, as well as focused task force operations. And the combination of all of that, uh, we anticipate uh, will will give us a good launching pad for the operations in RC East this coming summer and in the fall and in, into next year. Now, when we see that operations in the East and violence in the East has continued to go up over the last year, I realize that a lot of what you're talking about is a general sense of your plan for 2012 that you haven't yet carried out. So mm -hmm. clearly you're hoping to be in a better place in six or nine months than you are now. But to what extent does it gnaw at you that the strength of the Haqqani network could even be growing with time? I, I know last week in testimony, I think, in the Senate, uh, you talked about your hope that even if Pakistan does not clamp down on the sanctuaries, we can still muddle our way to a, a decent outcome, not as good of a place as we'd like to be. Uh, but I'm wondering your level of confidence in that assessment. If you've seen the violence keep going up uh, and you know that these sanctuaries are so potent, um, do you worry that the uptick in violence is actually a sign of a growing insurgency, or is it more a sign of your intensification of operations uh, and you're hopeful that it's going to trend down pretty soon? Well, I think it's a function of both. Did I actually use the word muddle through? In I didn't, no, you I, did not. I, I couldn't quite remember, you, but uh, if I did, I probably need to re rethink that bit of the testimony. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a function of a number of things, I, I believe. You know, the Haqqani's... Uh, my sense is, and we'd, of course we'd have to go to Miram Shah and ask them, but uh, if the ANSF continue to track, uh, if the ANSF continue to build their capability, uh, it's not going to spell, it's not going to be good news uh, for the Haqqanis. And as I think those of us who've been studying this, and so many people in this room who I recognize uh, who are real scholars at this, recognize that uh, for the, the Taliban and for the Haqqanis in particular, the sense is that now is their opportunity. Uh, the, it would appear that we are drawing down our strength, but the ANSF may, may not necessarily be ready. Uh, and so this could be the, their sense of the moment uh, when they may, could, they may be able to have significant or dramatic effect uh, in the battle space. Uh, we ran a couple of operations last year, frankly, uh, and they were to do a couple of things. One was to respond to the Haqqani's uh, operations in, in Kabul. Uh, and if you've been tracking the numbers, and I know a number of you have in here, uh, there have been some significant high-profile attacks uh, in Kabul. Virtually all of them uh, were planned uh, in the safe havens, uh, and in particular uh, with the Haqqanis. Uh, plus, there was significant operations in RC East. And we ran, ran some focused operations against the Haqqani network last year, specifically uh, to see uh, two things. A, how we could affect... Uh, their operational profile, but also to get a sense uh, in the context of a, of a deep battle, how they reacted to it and how we could leverage that reaction for further operations. So we learned a lot last year, actually, 
uh, in dealing with them uh, and dealing with their network. Uh, we were able to, uh, on a night operation, uh, detain their senior uh, field commander, uh, Haji Maji, Haji, Haji Mali Khan, uh, and we learned a great deal from him, and we learned a great deal from a number of the other uh, senior Haqqanis that were detained in this operation. And so our sense is that uh, while it will be their uh, intent, probably through the use of uh, high-profile attacks, uh, increased uh, tempo for suicide attacks, uh, assassination, uh, that their intent is to uh, uh, continue to inflict as much damage as they can uh, within inside RC East and to try to get inside Kabul again. Uh, anticipating that, conducting operations throughout the winter, uh, positioning and uh, posturing our forces in anticipation of that, uh, we're going to uh, spend a good bit of time concentrating on that network this coming spring and summer. It sounds like a corollary. Before I go and ask you a couple more questions about the Afghan army and police, a corollary to what you just said is that it would be fair to assume you may not get a lot of reconciliation done by the Haqqanis this year until they've decided whether or not they're going to be beaten, until they've decided just how effective ISAF and the ANSF are going to be at coming after them. You mentioned that a lot of the reintegrees are in the north and the west so far. Mm -hmm. um, it would seem that a logical inference from what you said is that if there's going to be reconciliation at a grand level or re even reintegration at a local level in the east, it may have to wait a few more months of impressive combat by ISAF and ANSF forces to show the enemy that there's no other way to get a, a good outcome. Is that a fair it's fair. Uh, we are getting some reintegrates in the east, and we are getting some in the south and southwest. Uh, it's it is a uh, it's it's our desire to increase those in all three of those areas: RC East, South, and Southwest. Uh, it's also not necessarily a uh, a function uh, of the uh, the willingness of the uh, the foot soldiers to come over. Uh, the whole process of reintegration. Uh, the High Peace Council, the Afghan Peace and Reconciliation process, et cetera, that whole process is still unfolding. It's still gaining bureaucratic traction, if you will. Uh, and the, uh, the support for the program is still growing uh, at the, at the uh, provincial and district levels. And as that process, where we find it working the best is where a provincial governor, a provincial chief of police, working closely with the local ANA commanders and ISAF, where they have uh, cooperated very closely is where we see the, the numbers uh, improving. A, because we keep the pressure up, but B, also as uh, reintegrates come off the battle space, come out of the battle space, uh, they can reintegrate back into their, into their villages uh, safely and securely. Uh, but for us, uh, we'll continue uh, to pressure the, the Haqqanis in the east um, throughout the battle, throughout the, uh, the fighting season of 2012. One question, just so I get a good geographic picture of how the campaign plan is affecting life in Afghanistan and the economy in Afghanistan. If we were to look at the ring road at this point, uh, how far are you from at least having made substantial progress towards securing uh, most of it? Obviously, it's never going to be perfectly safe, uh, at least not for a long time. But I know that the campaign plan was anticipating working more on the Kabul-Kandahar piece of it. Where do we stand in the overall progress with the Ring Road? Well, it still remains, a su substantial amount of it still remains to be uh, paved in the Northwest. And those contracts are uh, largely complete at this point, and we would anticipate uh, the act activity associated with uh, the paving of the final portion of, the, uh, of Route 1 or the Ring Road uh, to, to start this year. Uh, it is an explicit uh, part of the campaign for this coming year uh, to try to create uh, through uh, the connectivity from the Kabul security zone down to Kandahar, uh, the kind of uh, interaction as necessary, a freedom of movement as necessary, so that commerce uh, can open up between the two population centers. And that, that is uh, a key outcome that I, I hope to achieve in this year's campaign plan. In, in this year's campaign. A couple of questions on the ANSF, and then I'll go to uh, all of you. And I hope you're passing your cards to the outside, please, because in a couple of minutes, we're going to come and collect them. Uh, but if I could, General, let me ask you a little bit more about the Afghan security forces. And this has certainly been very welcome news to hear how you've been talking about them the last week. And you're not the first one to speak more favorably of them than sort of the common conventional wisdom. But it, you've still used some, some fairly um, you know, inspiring words. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit more to give us a bit more of an, maybe an anecdotal feel or 
uh, a soldier, a Marines field, for why they are, as you put it, better than we thought. You've quoted some of the statistics, that they're involved in about 90% of all the operations. They're leading 40% of them. Uh, they've got 138 out of 167 Kandaks that are at least in the top three tiers of readiness. That's right. That's right. Uh, those are all encouraging, but of course they're also, as Peter was uh, pointing out earlier, statistics of the type that are hard to integrate into a net assessment. What makes you feel overall pretty good about them? Sure. So much of this is the, is the human feel, the sense that we have as as our ISAF commanders uh, continue to interact with, uh, with the uh, ANSF elements. And, and as you might imagine, it's, it's different in different places. We've had some uh, success in some areas, uh, but we've had less success in, in others. Uh, where we have found that the CANDAC and brigade commanders are competent, uh, where they are not corrupt, uh, what we find is that uh, from that echelon of command down, uh, we can get some pretty good battlefield performance out of them. And that should be a surprise to no one. Uh, where we uh, find that uh, either there is an absence of competence or there could even, in fact, be corruption, uh, that has a tendency to chill uh, all of the echelons below it. So whether it's at the CANDAC or the TOLE level or the, uh, down at the, at the foot soldier level. Uh, and that varies from place to place. Uh, I was down in Kandahar recently with General Huggins, who was the commander of the Great 82nd uh, Airborne Division. And his relationship with the 205th Corps commander is extraordinarily good. Uh, and it starts with him. And his leadership is, uh, is very strong. Uh, he holds his uh, brigade commanders uh, to a high standard of performance. Uh, and in fact, has said to General Huggins on 1 July, I got it. You know, we're, we're going to be working together, but I got it. I'm going to take charge of this battle space. I mean, that's, that's exactly the kind of, of uh, enthusiasm. Uh, that's exactly the kind of assertiveness that we need to see uh, out of the ANSF. Uh, the uh, units, Task Force Hellman, Task Force Leatherneck in RC Southwest, uh, they began uh, pretty extensive partnered operations, although, as you pointed out correctly, partnered operations are occurring across Afghanistan. They began partnered operations uh, last year uh, extensively. Uh, and it was from them that I picked up the terms. They're better than we thought they would be uh, because in partnership they were uh, enthusiastic about the mission. Uh, they were aggressive in execution. But they also turned, turned out to be better than they thought they would be. And that played out at the CANDAC and brigade level as they became more competent in planning operations. Uh, you know, there is the sense that the Afghan is not a reluctant soldier. And he is not a reluctant soldier. In fact, the Afghans are some of the greatest individual fighters uh, going, frankly, from their history and from their recent experience. But what makes the difference between uh, one army to the, to the next is, is not necessarily the ferocity of the individual fighter. And that, of course, does play out in important places and important ways. It's how well the planning uh, can ultimately go forward. And a commander who is able to lead a coherent planning uh, program, pl planning effort, uh, to bring his staff together, uh, to go through the, the process of anticipating, planning, uh, and executing an operation, uh, that is the commander who is the commander of the future. And, and as you pointed out, it's about 89% of our operations now are partnered, and about 40% of those operations uh, are Afghan-led. And when they're Afghan-led, uh, although we may uh, offer our advice, um, sometimes it's very strong advice with respect to the trajectory of the planning, the development of the plan itself, and ultimate, ultimately the execution of the plan, uh, they are doing it in about 40% of those operations. And increasingly, those operations are occurring in RC East, which is really important because it is there where we have to build, excuse me, both the strong partnership uh, and the, uh, the willingness of the Afghans to lead because it's going to be there where the, the fight will probably be the longest in this insurgency and will be the most complicated. So my last question then would be, and it's a way to link a topic I haven't really gotten into very much today because Ambassador Crocker is not here and we haven't talked a whole lot about Kabul politics or the anti-corruption campaign there. And you, you did touch on it. A number of senators and congressmen asked you about it last week. But let me ask in a very operational sense. The kind of things that you're trying to do in the field with the commanders that you say are good, are competent, 
are not corrupt. Uh, to what extent do you get help from Kabul in at least trying to improve the average quality of these commanders? To what extent are you able to work, I realize often quietly, uh, with Minister Wardak, Minister Mohammadai, President Karzai, anyone else you need to, to try to encourage uh, a higher level, a higher quality of leadership in the ANSF? Do you get cooperation from them at least at that level, even if in some of the broader anti-corruption efforts we're still finding it pretty slow going? Um, the, the answer is, uh, it, it's, it's a really important question. The, we have used uh, the close cooperation that we have with uh, Minister Wardak, Minister Mohammadi, uh, with General Karimi. Uh, we have used that close cooperation uh, to try to identify those commanders uh, at a variety of levels uh, who we think are actually a, a risk to the campaign, not just our campaign, but the combined campaign uh, we uh, we have pointed out a number of uh, those individuals uh, to the senior leadership. Uh, some of those have been removed in, in a manner in which we would like to see them be removed, which means basically in an expeditious manner, uh, move them out of uh, command. Uh, the other thing we would like to not have happen is for them to resurface somewhere else where they could be yet again part of the problem. Uh, that's been mixed. Uh, some have been moved quickly, some have taken a long time, some haven't moved. That's the reality of the environment which we're in. Uh, some have been moved and resurfaced. Uh, we've had to deal with them again. Some have uh, not come back. Uh, last year, when uh, General Petraeus uh, and H.R. Uh, uh, McMaster uh, pointed out the problems with the National Military Hospital, the, uh, that commander was fired, I think, by the time the sun went down that day. So there, there are sometimes very aggressive, very immediate actions. There are sometimes when we'll point out uh, the need for someone to go. Uh, and there will be agreement, uh, but it won't, it'll take a long time or it won't happen. So uh, the, the intent is to help in this regard. It, it is a, a mixed result. Uh, now, the other side of the, of the leadership coin, though, I think, is beyond our support for the many who are doing well and our request for the, the some who need to go uh, through NTMA, uh, through the great work that Bill Caldwell uh, and his predecessors had put in place and now Dan Bolger is undertaking. There's an institutional emphasis on leadership, uh, which I think is really important. Uh, the Afghan Military Academy, their version of West Point in, in actually many ways, uh, has just graduated as fourth class. Uh, that's a very important uh, outcome. This is a class where the individuals are assigned by lottery, not by who they know. Uh, the uh, education of the staff NCOs and the NCOs is well in hand. Uh, the numbers of service branch schools, if you will, that have come into effect in the last year that give us the level of uh, specialty training at a quality level uh, have uh, come online and have improved the human capital in many ways. So it, it isn't just about getting after individuals who create difficulty across the, the broad spectrum of, of capacity. Uh, it, it is that. But it's also incentivizing and reinforcing the positive leadership uh, that we see out there in many of these formations, but also uh, a complementary uh, and aggressive institutional development as well of leadership that can ultimately step in and assume those positions at the captain, Kandak level, battalion level, and more senior as time goes on. As I asked for the index cards to be walked up, oh, that was quick. Uh, I was going to steal time for one last question, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Is, is it fair to conclude, if you're saying that 138 of the Kandaks are at least sort of, you know, level one, two, or three right. out of 167, right. that most of the force at least has leaders that you can work with. They may not yet be quite as good in all cases as you'd like, but the, the, the most problematic presumably would not score one of those top three ratings, or am I inferring too far? Uh, it may be a bit too far, but uh, the, the overall formation might still be capable, but right. the commander may not be as aggressive as we might like, or we're having to resupply on fuel more frequently than we might have thought we needed to, that sort of thing. Uh, but it does certainly play into the overall uh, assessment. I've got a question here about uh, civilian population safety and security in Afghanistan. And mm -hmm. uh, one thing we saw in the last year or two is that some of the statistics on enemy-initiated attacks that you gathered 
were headed in a favorable direction downward, mm -hmm. whereas some of the UN statistics, um, largely because of Taliban action, obviously, were headed in the wrong direction. And as a result, overall civilian uh, sense of security was not always in, in, in polling data and survey data mm -hmm. quite as optimal as it might have been or headed in the right direction. What sense do you have about how the Afghan population is feeling these days about their own security uh, as, as another important metric to consider? Well, I think the Asia Foundation did some uh, very important polling uh, last year. Uh, and I, I think their sense is that there is still a security problem. Uh, and I don't recall the numbers exactly. It's probably worth uh, pointing them out at some point to a uh, august group like this, but uh, I would say that while they felt that there was still a security problem, uh, the, the sense was it was a security problem in the next village, necessarily than a security problem in their own village. Uh, there's also some important uh, polling data which uh, has indicated that the sense amongst the Afghans for the quality of their police is rising uh, pretty significantly, uh, as is the sense among the Afghans for the quality of their army. Uh, and so if, you're, if your sense is that while there is still a security problem, but it, it may be in the next village over, uh, and that you're uh, relatively confident uh, in the uh, capabilities and the, quote, non-corruption of the police and the capabilities of the army is growing, then I think that there is, uh, there is hope that the population will be on the right trajectory ultimately to accept the credibility of the security services. And that, of course, uh, augurs well for the acceptance of governance uh, by extension. Uh, and so that is, uh, it, there is much work to be done in that regard, uh, particularly in terms of lowering civilian casualties. Uh, we've worked very hard at that. Uh, I'm not satisfied that we are where we need to be, although in this roughly the same 12 weeks of last year, measured this year, the, the numbers of civilian casualties that were uh, inflicted by ISAF are down pretty dramatically, about 60 to 70 percent. But that's still too many in, in my mind. And we work very, very hard to uh, ensure that when we uh, deliver uh, supporting arms, in particular air fires, uh, that we try to do so with the maximum precision that we can. Uh, and that we adhere as closely as we can to the, to the rules of engagement. Uh, as well, we have uh, retrained the force a couple of times on escalation of force, uh, the employment of supporting arms. Uh, I've reissued virtually all of my tactical directives, uh, which uh, continue the process of emphasizing that commanders at all levels really need to do all they possibly can to ensure that target identification uh, is solid before we deliver any fires with the idea of of reducing to the maximum extent possible uh, the casualties among the civilians. Now, the other side of the same coin is we we need to do what we can to protect the civilians from from the uh, uh, the Taliban and from the insurgency. And those numbers are up. Uh, well over 80 uh, percent of the civilian casualties are inflicted by the Taliban. So protecting the population in a population-based counterinsurgency. Uh, isn't just uh, the combat operations against the insurgency. It's doing all that you can to protect the population from the, from the attacks of the enemy. And we're seeking all that we can to do that. Uh, we're also running a series of uh, quarterly and semi-annual conferences uh, with the Afghans, joint uh, conferences, to bring in uh, NGOs, uh, Afghan influencers, uh, anyone who wants to attend, to talk about uh, how we can all, as a group, do more to reduce the civilian casualties and increase, to your question, increase the sense of security. And the very next conference, because the ANSF has, has in fact uh, become uh, sufficiently pervasive and capable that they now have to worry about civilian casualties, the very next conference will be jointly hosted mm -hmm. by ISAF and the ANSF with the Afghan population on how we'll continue the process of, of reducing civilian casualties. Now I've got a question about the uh, difficult matter of uh, so-called green on blue attacks, uh, Afghan security forces turning their weapons on your soldiers and all of our soldiers. And uh, the question, I think, is, has two parts. One is, and you got at this with your testimony a bit, but to briefly review which of the new procedures for vetting you think are most hopeful, recognizing that it's still uh, hard to prove that there's a favorable trend in the, 
in the number of these incidents. But also, to what extent is this eroding morale and eroding trust and eroding the ability of ISAF forces and Afghan forces to work together? Well, the, uh, the new HTEP vetting uh, process has an important uh, role played in it by the NDS, uh, which is going to be important to us. As well, we'll continue uh, the process of, in, of requiring uh, village elders to vouch uh, for those who would like to enlist, and that, that permits us to have a direct line relationship back into the villages when the time comes. The NDS being the intelligence service. Yes, the National Director for Security. I apologize. Yes, the, the NDS is going to become... Uh, extensively involved both in the vetting uh, but also in the in the day-to-day -day work with the ANA uh, and the ANP uh, on helping them to ferret out uh, what could be uh, the appearance of extremism uh, or radicalism inside the ranks uh, to help them to spot and assess and, and even uh, investigate and take actions against that. So the NDS will be very helpful. Uh, there is an erosion uh, of trust that has emerged from this, uh, but I believe that the relationship is, is very strong nonetheless. We just had, tragically, two more uh, troops killed overnight uh, in what is now about the 40th uh, of these events that has, uh, that has happened. Uh, I, I think the relationship is very strong on the whole. Uh, for every one of these that occurs, and I don't want to diminish the importance or the tragedy of any one of them, but for every one of these that occurs, the numbers of interactions that our troops have every single day uh, with the ANA and A ANP forces can be measured in the tens of thousands. Uh, and so while, uh, yes, we are having them, they are elevated a bit now, uh, we are going to see, I think, soon measures that we are taking on the ISAF side, measures that have been taken on the uh, ANSF side, and then measures that we're taking together. I hope we'll, we'll begin to see that those uh, actions, uh, really unprecedented, uh, if you will, interagency and, and uh, national actions, uh, will begin to have uh, a benefit in, in driving those numbers down. But the, the Taliban has made no uh, secret about a desire to uh, infiltrate the, the ranks of the ANSF. Uh, and indeed, if you look at the numbers, and it's probably worth, Peter, getting those numbers as well, uh, the numbers of uh, Afghan forces that are also preyed upon, uh, what we'll call green on green, those numbers are high as well. So it is time for all of us together to look at this. But this is part of an insurgency. Uh, it is inherent in an insurgency to seek, to seek to disrupt that indigenous force, which ultimately is the great threat to the insurgency. So we shouldn't be surprised that the, uh, the Taliban are calling for the infiltration of the ranks. We also, so also should, shouldn't be surprised that every single one of these, when it occurs and is successful, the Taliban take credit for it. And the reality, of course, is from our investigations, they have accounted for less than 50 percent uh, of the infiltrations. These are generally self-radicalized or, uh, well, that's the term I will use. They're self-radicalized. They, they become uh, uh, focused on a particular issue. Uh, the, the urination video, for one thing, attracted a great deal of attention. The burning of the Quran. Uh, the the uh, the recent activities at Panjway. Th those are all potential factors in the decision-making of a single person ultimately to uh, take action. Uh, and so we're very careful about that. And, and the measures that we're taking uh, within the force, the measures that the Afghans are taking to protect themselves and in combination, uh, we hope will uh, first reduce vulnerabilities and begin to solve the problems. And I would also add that the Afghans uh, on their own, but also some in partnership with us, have had success in, uh, in their investigations uh, in apprehending a number of individuals who they detected because of the, the measures that they put in place. They detected that they were in the ranks. They detected that they were planning some form of an attack, and they have arrested a number of people already in this process. So uh, we, we hope to continue that momentum. Thank you for a thoughtful answer. And while we're on tough subjects, uh, there's a card uh, with a question about Pakistan's motives and the ISI's motives 
in tolerating or even at times perhaps condoning uh, the sanctuaries for the Quetashura and for the Haqqani network. And the question is to the effect of, uh, do you agree with Admiral Mullen in his last congressional testimony in September that one can almost view the Haqqani network as a veritable arm of the ISI? Um, and more broadly, uh, do you feel there's any way to persuade Pakistan's army and intelligence services to the extent they are more tolerant or even supportive of these groups than they should be? from our vantage point. Is there a way to persuade them to rethink that? We've been trying for a couple of years, if not longer, with little success, it appears. Well, I, I, in this forum, I can't really speculate uh, on why the ISI does anything with respect to the Haqqanis. I don't think we should be surprised that they have a relationship with them. Uh, that, that relationship between the ISI and a number of these uh, uh, organizations goes back a very long time. So we shouldn't be surprised they have a relationship with them, but I, I would uh, not speculate on what specific operational support they have or whether they're an action arm. Uh, I would just say that the, the relationship uh, potentially is unhelpful in that regard. Uh, but I would say that uh, there, are, there is, I think, opportunities for us with Pakistan uh, to increase uh, our cooperation. Uh, the 26th of the November cross-border uh, incident uh, set back uh, the relationship that we had across the border. Uh, and I have sought in the, in the aftermath of the investigation to put in a number of, con of control measures and to revamp a number of processes and procedures uh, which will reduce to the maximum extent possible uh, the recurrence of something like that. But in the process of doing that, We've also been able to, I think, in helpful and useful ways, uh, restore the cross-border relationship with the Pakistan's uh, senior military leadership. And to that extent, there have been several meetings, uh, three in the last couple of months, where uh, ISAF general officers, uh, ANSF general officers, and Pakistani general officers have met uh, to begin the process of restoring that border uh, relationship. But it was actually even more than that. Uh, the border relationship uh, was important to the overarching trilateral relationship, ISAF, ANSF, and PACMIL, uh, which would culminate ultimately in a tripartite relationship where we could even do uh, campaign planning so that we had complementary effects across the border. Uh, those had, on a previous occasion, I'd probably some of you here were involved in the operations themselves, but there were operations that have been run in the last couple of years on both sides of the border uh, often called a hammer and anvil type operation where one side or the other uh, would flush the enemy out of a safe haven on one side or the other, drive it across the border into the operational forces on the other side. And we'd like to get back to that level. Uh, right now, of course, uh, much of the relationship uh, is uh, subject ultimately to the outcome of the debate that is occurring in the Pakistani parliament, uh, where the I think the parliamentary uh, Committee on National Security has been chartered uh, to review the relationship between the United States and Pakistan and to make a series of recommendations. Uh, so we're, we're not to the point with the Pakistanis that we can have that kind of a, of a conversation about complementary or cooperative operations across the border. But I'd sure like to get there again, and we actually were on the 25th of November, the day before, when I was meeting with General Kayani, talking about uh, the potential for complementary operations. Uh, it, is, it was a strength uh, prior to that event. Uh, it held great opportunity, I think, uh, to uh, give substance to the commitment of Pakistan ultimately to dealing with insurgents and dealing with the safe haven, op uh, safe haven issue. Uh, safe havens have, have been no value really to the uh, Pakistanis either. They've had more than 2,000 killed in their own counterinsurgency operations in the last couple of years. They've paid a price for POC mill operations. Uh, and so uh, de depending on the outcome of that debate in the, in the parliament in Islamabad, uh, it would be my desire. Uh, I know General Mattis shares my views on it. Uh, General Karimi does as well. Uh, it would be my desire that we begin as soon as we can to talk about how we might combine our capabilities across the border uh, to get after the safe havens in general, but also to, to go after some of the insurgents. Next question is about the strategic partnership agreement. And I know we don't want to talk about the specifics of what we're trying to negotiate 
uh, with the Afghan government about a long-term relationship post-2014. But the question gets to the specific issue of whether there's a chance still that this could be concluded before the NATO summit in May. But I'm going to take the prerogative of the moderator to ask an additional question, which is, does it even matter? Are we making too much of the time pressure in the sense that it would appear both sides have a pretty strong interest in making this happen someday? And if night raids and other such things that we have to you know, maintain at an intense level for a few more months or a couple more years even are an impediment in the short term, shouldn't we just be patient? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I, I don't think there's any absence of uh, desire or commitment by either our president or uh, President Karzai to have a strategic partnership. In fact, I, uh, I know that they have both recently reaffirmed uh, their respective desires that ultimately the United States and uh, Afghanistan have a strategic partnership. Uh, President Karzai convened the Loya Jirga last year uh, specifically with the intent that the 2,000 or so Afghans uh, who were invited to participate in this uh, paramount expression of Afghan will, if you will, the Loya Jirga, with, even within the context of the Constitution, uh, they gathered they deliberated for several days and ultimately returned uh, a collective uh, decision or collective recommendation to President Karzai that uh, Afghanistan's uh, interests in the future uh, were best served by uh, a strong relationship with the international community in general, but a strategic partnership with the United States in particular. I think that was very positive. Uh, in the course of the development of the strategic partnership itself, uh, we have sought to address a couple of uh, long-term issues that uh, Afghanistan has been uh, concerned about, and it's a function of sovereignty for them, and we certainly understand that. And the first is the issue of uh, the Afghans uh, maintaining uh, law of armed conflict detention, administrative detention of insurgents who are picked up in the battlefield. Uh, we successfully, Wardak, uh, Minister Wardak and I signed the minister, uh, Memorandum of Understanding for that about three weeks ago, a uh, very successful uh, event. Uh, it was a real uh, affirmation of Afghan sovereignty, uh, and I think for Afghanistan it was a, an important moment uh, for them in this insurgency when you think about the fact that we will be transferring about 3,000 detainees that, that the U.S. has been holding in law, in the administrative detention under the law of armed conflict to the Afghans. That's a big accomplishment for them. Uh, the other uh, issue that we're dealing with right now is a, uh, an agreement uh, on night operations, and uh, we're at a pretty uh, critical moment in, in those discussions. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the strategic partnership itself goes forward, and I believe that should we be successful in completing uh, the night operations uh, memorandum of understanding within uh, the next couple weeks or so, there is time ultimately for a strategic partnership uh, to be concluded by the United States and Afghanistan. Uh, but more to follow on that. But I, it is important. It would be good to have it done by Chicago, where the heads of state of the 50 ISAF nations will gather together. Uh, many of those uh, nations have uh, concluded their own bilateral agreements with the Afghans to this point, uh, and NATO intends to have a strategic partnership with uh, Afghanistan. Uh, so it would be, uh, I think, a really important signal, uh, both to the international community, to all of ISAF, and certainly to Afghanistan, if that other key strategic partnership is concluded by then as well. Just uh, two more questions, questions, General, as we, as we uh, finish up, and thank you. Uh, couple uh, here that I'll synthesize into one, and then I've got a final question. The, the uh, couple on drug production and opium and poppy uh, are to the effect of, do you see any continued progress in reducing the yield, um, especially in the South, but in general? And does it even matter in the short term for the counterinsurgency campaign? We know there was a rethinking, certainly of the sequencing of eradication in particular by Ambassador Holbrook and others uh, two, three years ago. These questions are to the effect, do you see progress in reducing poppy production, and how worried are you about it even if you don't see such progress? I think right now, uh, while that is important to us, and we've had uh, mixed success uh, in the last couple of years in, re in reduction of uh, uh, poppy growth and the harvest, uh, what is really important to us right now is the development of the 
relationships necessary to, to undertake a systematic approach over the long term at a strategic level of getting after the poppy crop and the whole drug enterprise. Uh, Afghanistan's uh, efforts have come a long way in the last uh, couple of years to include not just a national strategy, but the capabilities that have been built uh, within the MOI in, in the special police units, uh, both in terms of uh, investigative capabilities, but also interdiction, have come a very long way. And, and it's here where uh, a number of our partnership uh, arrangements have really paid big dividends. Uh, where, especially where the Afghan uh, CF Triple Three, Commando Force Triple Three, uh, TS Triple Four, uh, the NIU, uh, the Sensitive Investigative Unit, all, all of these organizations, uh, many of which are vetted, uh, most of which are mentored or partnered, have really come a very long way. Uh, but we've also seen on the ISAF and international community side uh, a substantial improvement, I think, in interagency. Uh, and intergovernmental uh, cooperation as well. Uh, for the U.S., uh, the role of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Department of Justice, FBI. Uh, on the uh, U.K. side, for example, there have been some, uh, there's been some superb partnership with, with uh, SOCA, uh, with their, uh, an intelligence organization that does multi-source uh, uh, analysis for us. All of that together has permitted us to get at what we consider to be a, a nexus targets. Nexus targets are, are vexing for us, and we can't ignore them. They have an important uh, role uh, for the insurgency, and, and it is the relationship between the drug enterprise, the criminal patronage networks, and the insurgency. And where we saw some of this coming together, for example, uh, in places like Colombia, for example, uh, we see the nexus target as a means to place uh, significant pressure ultimately to get after the criminal patronage networks, and we are targeting uh, kingpins now. Uh, we're targeting the, uh, uh, the laboratory uh, production and dissemination uh, processes, but we're also going after the insurgents who provide protection and extortion and muscle for the whole uh, enterprise. So that, that nexus target for us in cooperation at, a, at an intergovernmental, interagency, and bilateral relationship with the Afghans has been the process we have sought to get into place. And once we get it into place, then we can really get after the process, ultimately, of, of, re of reducing uh, the poppy crop. Uh, as well, the Food Zone Program has been very effective in uh, RC Southwest. Governor Mongal has done uh, terrific work in that regard, and we'd like to see that uh, replicated in other places in Afghanistan. Before I ask the last question, I want to again thank everyone here. I don't think you've seen a person move, even though we're 15 minutes over time. It's a testament to your uh, riveting presentation and how much uh, we're all learning from you here today, General. Also, as we finish, after he's given his last answer and we've all thanked him, please just give a minute for, for us to get off stage and remain in your seats, if you don't mind, for just a moment. Uh, the, the final question today has to do with ethnic uh, cooperation within Afghanistan itself. And again, there's a whole other level of this that we could talk about, but I won't press you on in terms of Kabul politics, the post Karzai transition in 2014, Afghan political parties. But I'd like to make it more specific to the kind of issues you're dealing with as Kam ISAF within the Afghan security forces themselves. And to what extent are you worried about this problem, to put it uh, bluntly? To what extent are you worried that Tajik Pashtun or intra Pashtun tensions or anything else could, especially as the presidential race, approaches in Afghanistan and our departure looms, or at least the majority of our troops draw down, that these could come to the surface? And to what extent do you think that you see harmony or greater cooperation, at least a common sense of purpose, that gives you hope for the future? Uh, it's an important question because it has, it has dominated uh, both the interest in Afghanistan but also the reality of Afghanistan for a long time. Uh, and so I will, uh, I will tell you that we, we watch the proportions closely uh, within the ANSF. But I say that carefully because the, the management of the proportions uh, isn't a function of what we do. It's a function of what the Afghans are doing. And the Afghans recognize that uh, an ANSF that is uh, reflective of the population, that has the right kinds of proportions uh, of the 
the ethnicities, uh, the confessions, if you will, the, the, uh, uh, the ethnic minorities. Uh, it's, it's in the interests of Afghanistan writ large. We, we like to say that the ANSF, uh, when it ultimately is built and fielded, uh, when it is achieving in the, in the battle, on the battlefield what we hope it will, will become the symbol of national unity. Uh, not just out to 2014, but beyond. And it'll become a symbol of national unity because uh, we don't have Tajik units. We don't have Pashtun units. We have units where we have sought to create ethnic balance. Some are out of balance. And, and in fact, the entire force is slightly out of balance. But again, we watch the numbers and we seek to uh, focus recruiting efforts in ways uh, that can address uh, or redress the, the potential uh, imbalances. But if, the, if we really believe, as the numbers would seem to imply, that the Afghan people have confidence in their ANSF growing with the police, high with the army, and if that army is broadly representative of the many different ethnicities of Afghanistan, and it becomes, in essence, the shield of the state for the purposes of stability, then I think we will have created, we the Afghans themselves, will have created uh, that really vital role for the military and the police, which is not just to fight, but to be the symbol of what Afghanistan can be in the future, which is a nation of many different kinds of people uh, united in a common cause, in this case, the security of the state to permit the development of governance, to address the issues of corruption, to provide uh, opportunity for economic development. Uh, and if we're successful uh, in this, if the Afghans are successful in continuing the forces to, to have the face of all of Afghanistan and not the face of one particular ethnicity, then I think we'll have been successful. Well, General, as you go uh, and, and prepare to head back, we certainly want to send our thoughts and prayers for you and your troopers uh, from all Thank of you. us. And we want to extend a very warm uh, hand of applause and thanks and admiration for what you're doing. Thank, Thank you very much.